Hey everyone, how you doing today? As I mentioned in our daily financial news, we have two experts today, but first we bring on the lovely Anna Kelly. How you doing? I am doing so great. I always love your introductions and I love being here. I have so much fun. Oh, that's wonderful. One of the things I love about having my experts on, and they've been picked on purpose because they brand, they, they're just a wide, wide spectrum of experts. With you today, I want to talk about vacation rentals, Airbnb, but but high-end Airbnb. We're talking waterfront mansions, looking at lakes and stuff. So you, you have three of these things. I have no experience with Airbnb at all, uh, but let alone vacation or high-end Airbnb. So, so let's talk about that as a business model. Uh, are you finding um, it's tough sledding? Or are you just crushing it now? What's, what's going on in the high-end? So I love high-end vacation rentals. I will tell you, I've had four and I sold one this last year because it was part of our business plan to exit when we could sell it high. We bought it as a flip um, to, but you have, got, you have to hold them a couple of years to prove rental income before you sell them, right? Okay. So I have three still and it's amazing. I can tell you that the most recent one that I purchased, I am killing the returns I make on multifamily. I'm, I'm making so much better return on my money. Um, on a high-end vacation rental, but it, it is very location specific, right? Um, certain markets are going to do much, much better. And like we talked about last week, it all comes down to supply and demand. And so that is the key. You must understand very well before you purchase one, what is the supply? What is the demand? And because the purchase price is much higher, there's a lot more at stake to get that right before you move forward. So let's set this one up so not everybody remembers the video. I think we talked about it a month ago. So uh, your last purchase is, I, I'm going to call it an estate because it's just gorgeous, sits up on a hill uh, and has this, this grand view of what I'll call a lake. It might be a reservoir. I'm not sure. Um, but you found that uh, the sellers were older. It was outdated. You, you negotiate. You bought it right, which is key. Then you had to spend a bunch of money updating it because uh, I'm going to guess high-end Airbnb travelers, they want their stuff. They're probably pretty picky, I'm guessing. And, yes. um, you know, so talk about that kind of the day you closed to, to where it went into, I guess, inventory or when people could select it. I mean, is it is it weeks, months? I mean, what, what's going on? Sure. So, you know, coming back to kind of the supply and demand, there's this lake, it's about two hours from me, which was okay. key. It is close. My other ones are about four hours away on the ocean. And being only two hours away, I knew, you know, if this doesn't work out to be as profitable as I think it will, because there's always that chance, right? No matter how smart we think we are and how much we run the numbers, yep. or if something yep. happens like the pandemic and it goes longer and people can't come, Am I going to have bad years? Mm -hmm. If so, I like the option of being able to have a place that we would actually go enjoy it if people don't show up, right? Ah, so yes. that was a big factor for, for me in this particular lake location. Now, going to the, growing up on the lake, I always was used to homes that are on the water. I can walk out my back deck, you can get in the boat, you can be on the water. And that's what I wanted and envisioned for myself. Mm -hmm. But what I realize is that the lake communities near my, near me within a couple of hours that have that availability either are very, very, very old and there's so much supply that you're really not going to kill it and stand out above the competition because there's going to be 50 or 100 more. They're always tit for tat, right? Mm. The beauty of this lake, Mike, is it's up in a mountain. It's surrounded by a couple of mountain ranges and it's a man-made lake that's like 200 feet deep. And it is all surrounded by federal game land. So there's no houses on the water. There are only cabins, a lot of lodges and cabins in the woods of the mountains. And very few of them actually have water views. So you're there in a lake area, but you can't actually see the water or walk out to the water. So you either need to be by the marina, by the boat dock, or have a view to stand out above the rest of the, the supply, right? So we saw this amazing home. The, the owner spent 1.2 million back in 1998 to build it. Wow. So it was a very expensive home for that time. But the key to the house is it has the best view, bar none, maybe two other houses have a view that's close, 
but compared to hundreds of properties in the area, it's one of maybe three mm. that have really mm. good views. And down the road, right down my road, you turn right, there's the boat dock. And it's like eight miles from the marina. So it has all of the stuff that people come for. It has the mountains for the hunters that don't care about the water, but, but it's nice to look out and see wildlife down below. There's an eagle's nest and eagles flying all through my backyard. There are deer and bear prints, you know, everywhere. But it's got this view and, you know, the view, the location, 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 that is the key. The view sets us apart and being close to water. So what that means is I have not only a beautiful home, but it has that combination of things that can't be replicated by just making your house prettier or giving them more amenities, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, when, when I talk about supply and demand, it's also what can I do to stand above the competition that'll keep me there where there's nothing like my place and they're going to come back over and over and over for mine versus all the other ones on the market. Yeah, that's amazing. So again, built in 1998, it was built, we'd, Airbnb wasn't a thing, at least I know of in 1998. So this was built as someone's primary or do you, was it a second home for them? It was a primary residence and they okay. were an older couple. They were retired and they built this amazing home. But as an older couple, when they built it, they built it in a way that looked extremely dated, probably even for the late 90s. So my kids and our partner's kids, they called it the Mar Martha Washington house, you know, <laughs> green and maroon shag carpet. Oh yes. Oh yeah. They, uh, yeah. Green and maroon. The, their living room looks like looked like the, the president's house. Like it had dark wood wow. desks built in and you know, very nicely edged, extremely expensive carpet, but it was maroon and green. Dark curtains covering every beautiful window that could let you see the water and let you see a mountain edge, all covered in dark. Wow. Dark wood trim everywhere, um, yellow and green on the walls. It just, it was dated. And so when it set, it went on the market for close to a million dollars okay. and over four years, Michael, they couldn't sell it despite the view, they could not sell the property. And I think that was for a couple of reasons. One is because people do not have vision. They don't know what they can make it into. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing is other investors who came to see it, Offered them much lower price, but they weren't motivated sellers at the time. They weren't going to budge. They spent 1.2 million and they're like, we're not budging off our price. They didn't have to move, right? So motivation is an important point too. Mm -hmm. But people couldn't see past the vision because every other house in this area were built to look like cabins and lodges. They've got the nice A-frames, beautiful windows. You look out and you see everything or the sun's coming in. And this was built as a single family home. So where lots of people came in and said, oh, this won't be a good rental because it doesn't have that lodge style. And their realtor that represented them told us the same thing. People have been in and out, but they said, eh, it's too cookie cutter, like closed floor plan, older. It would need too much to put in it. When we came, we said, wait a second. What other people think is not a deal is what's going to make it an amazing deal for me, right? And that's my mindset in every investment is, I could say the same thing, but I said, hey, I see huge opportunity because me as a renter, I don't like the mountains. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like, I grew up with, you know, a dad that hunts and I enjoy, you know, I enjoy animals, but I don't enjoy hunting. I don't enjoy being in a cold mountain. I don't want to be in a dark lodge that feels woodsy. Mm -hmm. I want to be in a place that where I can relax like a spa. Right. Yeah. So I said, wait a second. What if our place was the only place on this whole lake region that feels like a spa and relaxing getaway that overlooks nice. the lake? We can have some animal touches and we have a guy's room that's like a man cave, but it's all kind of a shabby, chic, classic look. Nice. And we opened up walls, opened up the floor plan, and now it's going to be it's going to be the nicest home that's not lodge like on that entire lake. And the other thing that I know, Michael, that's important with luxury rentals is I know almost 90% of the people that are searching and booking their vacation are women. They're not men. Oh, men are letting their wives wow. book. So me as a woman, when I look at all these pictures of these beautiful places, I'm like, they're pretty, but they're dark. They're <laughs> lodgy. Like, ugh. Ugh. I, I, I decorated ours extremely light and area and classy. 
where a woman can go, I can relax. And there's a place for the guys and there's a separate place for the kids while mm. they go hunt. I don't feel like I'm in a cabin. And Michael, we booked, we, we put it online on VRBO on Airbnb two weeks ago, and we've already booked 40 nights at a thousand bucks a night. <laughs> so <laughs> there's definitely, yeah, but you have to have vision. Yeah. You have to find that yeah. property. That's something different. That's really always going to be something different. Yeah. And that's, what's going to make you successful in the high end space versus all the other people that offer something kind of similar. That's amazing. So let me, let's, let's put, if I got a couple more questions about this story, cause this is amazing. So you walk into this, this unit, you see things that others don't, but you definitely change carpet. You definitely get rid of the drapes. You know, when you walk through and you go crunch some numbers, was this a 50 K hundred K? I mean, what, what'd you throw into this after purchase to turn it into this thousand dollar night luxury? A lot. And we're not done, right? We're over budget. We're over budget, you okay. know, because here's the thing, no matter how good you are at, at estimating rehab costs, you know, mm -hmm. I flipped a lot of properties. I have rehabbed a lot of apartments and houses and whatnot. Oh yeah. But there's always things that you don't see that you think, oh, it's a 22 year old house. We're not going to have problems with this or that, but there are right. Yeah. So we, you know, just, just to give you an idea. So $1.2 million built in 1998. We, they, we, they dropped their listing finally down to 800,000 okay. and we offered seven and we got it, but we played a little hardball and lots of back and forth and several weeks because we weren't budging because of what work it needed. So we paid seven, half a million less than what it yeah. was built for 20 years later. Right. That's awesome. So we budgeted to put in about 120,000 to have be all in at 820. Mm -hmm. And we're at about 130 right now. Oh. So we're, we got a little more to go, but not much. So we're not too far over budget. Yeah. Most people say yeah. estimate an extra 10%. Yeah, so we I'm, knew yeah, you're, we made you're, 10 under. Dude, that's close enough. I mean, you know. I'd call that a win. <laughs> so we're close. We're close. But we, we noticed, so things like they, you know, all the carpet obviously was terrible throughout. So 20 grand in new flooring, which was actually a really good deal because I get commercial pricing from amazing contractors that I do business with all the time. So that helped. Um, what we didn't anticipate is you don't really know even walking through a couple of times when things are covered with dark curtains, all the trim was put on very poorly. Uh, and what happened was we didn't know till after is all this dark, beautiful trim that we thought we had, it was put on cricket, it was cracked. And the, the homeowner tried to do it themselves after they built it, right. they, they did their own trim or changed it. So, you know, walls were uneven and crooked. So we had to smooth them out and sand them. And, you know, again, if you have high end tenants that are paying you patches and crooked everything, you need to make it nice. It needs to look new. So we spent a lot of money just on, you know, fixing the walls and the trim, taking it all out. We turned a couple walls. Um, we... We shiplapped a couple rooms. So we kind of kept this, you know, Joanna Gaines, like shiplap yeah. is kind of a thing. Yeah. And I was like, we want to yeah. have it feel lakey and feel mountainy, but not do not be overdone. And so we chose to do shiplap in three rooms. One of them's white in the dining room. It has a beautiful Waterford, Waterford crystal chandelier. Nice. And the others are really light wood shiplap that give you that kind of lodgy mountainy feel. Um, but with a very shabby chic kind of look. Very so, cool. you know, it was mostly that kind of thing. Um, furnishing a six bedroom house is, is <laughs> Not too, cheap. You know? yeah, I guess. Um, That's funny. So, you know, new headboards and lamps and nightstands, sleeper sofas that'll hold up to wear and tear. You know, you got to get stuff that feels classy, but yet it can hold up. And so the furnishings are, are very expensive. Um, totally redid the landscaping. We're totally repaving the driveway. It was up a, a, a muddy, you know, rivet filled road up to our mountain. We took down lots of trees so we could create more parking for boats and people that want to come. So, you know, a lot of work went into this thing and it's consumed our weekend since January. So it's, you know, two and a half months to get it prepared. And that's having contractors there all day through most of it. And us just going on the weekends to kind of, you know, take kind of GC it, see what's done, you know, fix things up. But but here here's the amazing thing. And maybe I'll let you ask me questions and then we can talk profitability. Sure. 
Yeah. So one of the things I was curious about is, um, did you change any windows? Cause I, I, I've seen the views. Did you, did you expand any windows or make sliders? Cause again, the view is something you're one of three. Did you, did you do any of that? So we already had in, in the two main living rooms, these beautiful, um, doors that they're, they're like quad doors and they open up. Yeah, so every good. room on the main level kind of opens up and we have this beautiful sitting room. We have three decks. Oh, nice. So on the main at levels, we didn't do anything on the lower level. We had an unfinished room that had this little tiny window like this up at the top. And we cut it out and made it a really big picture window through the block. And we finished, framed out the room and, um, and ship lapped it. Okay. So that room is much better views, but really just painting everything light and removing all the curtains. Mm allowed Amazing. all the light to come in and it to be beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. So what I hear from folks that do Airbnbs kind of in cities where they're competing with lots of others, they got to be somewhere around 18 to 20 nights to break even. I'm going to guess at a thousand bucks a night, you don't need 20 nights to, to kind of break even in a month, I'm guessing. Oh, in a month? No. Yeah. So, so here was the other thing that really drew me to this area. I liked the area, but again, I was like, I can't even walk out on the water, right? Till I saw this house and I was kind of convinced, but I thought how many people are really wanting to come? It's kind of out of the way. It's up in a mountain. You know, am I going to have as many people that want to come as they do Ocean City, Maryland, for example, where my three beach houses were. So what was really surprising to me is that in the last couple of years, all of a sudden Raystown Lake, where this property is, is just in, in huge demand. Because it's kind of the closest lake to Penn State University, to ah. Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. It's real centrally located there and even parts of New York. Um, there is a mountain trail that I didn't even know existed, a mountain bike trail that is world famous. People hmm. come in April to ride this mountain bike trail from France, from Italy, from all over. Wow. And then they're wow. like, we didn't even know you had a lake. We just wanted to come to the trail, right? <laughs> so, so many things draw people there. Nice. The shopping, the, the sporting events, the mountain biking, the hunting. So it's really like April through the end of November. It's a much longer rental season. Nice. We're at the ocean in the Northeast. It doesn't stay warm like California all year. <laughs> so we've really got 12 weeks to get it done. Like all your income comes in 12 weeks okay. and a few weekends, maybe in May and in September, early October, and then you're done. So what was surprising to me, just to give you a, a difference of, of how varied the profitability can be. Mm -hmm. The beach house I bought in, in August, we paid 750 for, 725 or 750, I can't remember, but close. We will make about $80,000 a summer. So gross 10% on the purchase. My expenses are gonna be about 65,000 a summer. So I'll only profit 15 grand on a $750,000 purchase, but I bought it primarily as a second home that I want to use, right? right? Even buying it significantly below its value, it's hard to profit on luxury rentals in Ocean City when you only got 12 weeks, right? So you're buying it for a mix of enjoyment plus rental. When you go in warmer areas or something that offers year-round um, amenities that draw people, you will do much, much, much better. So comparably, something we're going to have about 130000 in we will gross 200,000. Mm. So more than double what I will at the beach for the same purchase price. And my break even is 50. Mm. So, you know, 830 total purchase. Um, and we should make about $150,000 net a year. Not Much a bad better deal. deal. Much better deal. Yeah. 10 <laughs> times the net that I make at the ocean. But again, it's, it's, it's supply, it's demand. Yeah. It's the purchase price. The beauty of this is that the, the HOE the fees and the taxes are very low. And sometimes in these big beach cities, their real estate taxes are crazy because wow. they have so much tourism coming in mm -hmm. um, and the HOA fees are crazy. So profitability is a very wide and, and varied, just like on single family or on multifamily. It's not like buy a luxury rental and you're going to win and you're going to profit lot of risks if you don't know your numbers. You know, if you assume that, hey, if I spend 750 or eight, I'm going to always make 200 and this location, you're going to make 80, you're going to be in trouble. So you got to know your numbers. 
Well, very cool. Last last question. We'll we'll close this video. Out. Could I get the link to your VRBO or Airbnb? I want to put it in the description so people can check out your amazing house. Absolutely, I'd love to do that. Yeah, maybe maybe somebody will even book it. We'll get you some get you some nights. So that'd be fun. that'd be awesome. One closing thought, just real sure. quick. This is a great time to find luxury high end rentals, and and we've talked a little bit about this, but where a lot of these regular you know rentals like you know, regular price range, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in a city are um, are doing okay. They're you're not getting a steal on the price. A lot of these very high end rentals were bought as second homes, yeah. not to be rented out by others. And because they were bought as second homes, when higher end individuals lose their jobs or their businesses are shut down, first thing they're going to do is they're going to get rid of that second home. And so there's many more motivated sellers. So both of the most recent high-end luxury rentals I bought, both the, the beach house and the lake house, were distressed and motivated sellers. And that allowed me to buy them at a price point that was well below what I knew I could sell them for yeah. so that I knew that I was going to be more profitable. And even if it didn't work out like I hoped it did or it was short-lived and just you know didn't keep going um, based on rules and restriction changes, pandemics, whatever... I knew I could get out and still make a profit. And so that's key. Know your numbers, look for distressed and motivated sellers, but you can find better deals on high-end rentals today than you can the average rental in, in most areas. I think that is very wise advice. I'm glad we close on that. Thank you very much, Anna.